We begin our worship with the invocation and the reading. Please rise. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. The reading this morning comes from Matthew, the 22nd chapter. Then the Pharisees went and plotted how to entangle Jesus in his talk. And they sent their disciples to him, along with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are true and teach the way of God truthfully, and you do not care about anyone's opinion, for you are not swayed by appearances. Tell us, then, what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, Why put me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin for the tax. And they brought him a denarius. And Jesus said to them, Whose likeness and inscription is this? They said, Caesar's. Then he said to them, Therefore, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And when they heard it, they marveled, and they left him and went away. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning. Yes, that's right. It's another of those philosophy guys, someone who wants you to step back and think about what we're doing and whether it's a good idea. Now, by that very loose definition, notice, Jesus is a philosopher. And he shows it in his handling of the question about taxes. The Pharisees and Herodians artfully devise a question which they think will trap Jesus in a dilemma. In logic, a branch of philosophy, a dilemma arises when there are only two answers to a question and both of them are a problem. For example, have you stopped beating your wife? Answer, yes. Oh, so you were beating her then. Hang on while I call the police. Let's try that again. Have you stopped beating your wife? Answer, no. My gosh, not only a wife beater, but an unrepentant one. You're still doing it. There's no good answer to that question. And so, the Pharisee Herodian Alliance thinks that they have devised a Jesus-beating dilemma that will put Jesus in a bad light, no matter how he answers. First, they feign respect for Jesus' piety, attempting to lull him into a false sense of security, and then gloating maliciously over their slam-dunk humiliation, they spring their trap. Tell us then what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Here's how they think the play goes. If Jesus says, yes, it's lawful to pay the taxes, he'll undermine his popular support as the Jews resented the tax and resented even more the inscription on the silver denarius, which read Tiberius Caesar, son of the divine Augustus. So if Jesus answers yes, not only does he let down the oppressed Jews, it will seem as if he actually accepts Caesar's blasphemous pretensions to divinity and puts a mere man on the same level as God Almighty. Well, what about the no option? If Jesus says, no, it isn't lawful to pay taxes, well, then he'll get popular support, all right. The Roman IRS was at least as unpopular as our own. But he'll be seen as openly rebelling against the government and worthy of summary execution. Well, what this alliance hasn't reckoned on is that Jesus knows what they're up to. Instead of taking either of their baits, he makes them step back and critically evaluate what's going on. This alliance has fundamentally misunderstood God's view of authority, and they have confused what C.S. Lewis called first things and second things. So first of all, authority. It can't simply be a matter of choosing between Caesar or God as authority because, as Paul tells us, the governing authorities are instituted by God. He says in Romans 13, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted 
by God. So, of course, Christians must show proper respect for God's authority wherever they meet it, including in the person of Tiberius Caesar. And so, since Caesar has the right to raise taxes to govern the territories under his charge, there's no doubt that such monies belong to him. This, however, only means that Caesar is owed the coin as a piece of metal, recognized as legal tender. It doesn't follow that Caesar is owed the homage and worship of a god implied by the coin's inscription. So secondly, one must put first things before second things. God, the gift giver, is the first thing, and to God alone is our worship owed. Caesar is the second thing, a person with authority delegated by God. Now, our duty to worship doesn't just mean that we should attend worship, but also that we should recognize and praise God for every mental, physical, and spiritual gift we have, for all that we are. For as Luther says in his commentary on the first article of the Creed, that is, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, I believe that God has made me in all creatures, and he has given me my body and soul, eyes, ears, and all my members, my reason and all my senses, and still takes care of them. He also gives me clothing and shoes, food and drink, house and home, wife and children, land, animals, and all I have. He richly and daily provides me with all that I need to support this body and life. He defends me against all danger and guards and protects me from all evil. All this he does out only out of fatherly divine goodness and mercy without any merit or worthiness in me. And he finishes very significantly. For all this, it is my duty to thank and praise, serve and obey him. And that is why our first duty is to thank God for all that he has given us. In this broader sense, all the Christian life is worship, as Paul recognizes. Present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship, he says in Romans 12. So when Jesus answers, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's, he recognizes that God always comes first. We worship the gift giver, not the gift, and even the governing authorities are only a gift of God under his authority. Now, C.S. Lewis pointed out that it seems to be a recurring principle that if we try to put second things before first things, we not only do an injustice to the first things, but we don't get the second things either. In our age, Lewis argued, more and more people have walked away from putting God first and put civilization first instead. So they put Caesar, a second thing, before God. And yet all the evidence is that when you do that, civilization falls apart and you don't get the second thing either. Because if temporal power is put above the higher power of God, there is an inevitable babel of competing, conflicting interests and the common good is devoured by tribal factions. The pattern is clear everywhere. Businesses that put maximum profit above consumer service not only do consumers an injustice, but can expect to go out of business. As administrations become larger in healthcare and education, it seems that the perpetuation and enlargement of the administration becomes more important than serving patients and students. The more slogans about patient-centered care and student-centered education one sees, the less it actually seems to happen. It becomes more important to market the claim that one does something and hire an army of people to measure it than to actually do it. Something one might, I'm only guessing, have something to do with actual doctors and teachers. So Jesus recalls us to our senses. In God's economy, to be given authority is always a trust, as you just sang in the hymn. Are you a teacher, doctor, manager, or political leader? Then you're a steward, a servant of the people entrusted in your care. Leadership is a gift entrusted by God, and its purpose is to serve. It's not a license to impose one's will 
or the will of a small clique of fellow travelers. Our model for leadership is clear in Christ's own example, as we read in Matthew 20. You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them, and their great ones exercised authority over them. It shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be your slave, even as the Son of Man came not to be served but to serve and to give his life for a ransom for many. We are fortunate we don't have a do as I say, not do as I do kind of God. When God calls us to be servant leaders, he himself supplies the supreme example. Since God is perfect, we're in no position to give him anything he needs. And anything we do offer him is already his own. But God gave his only son to suffer and die for us, knowing that we could give him nothing. And this then sets us free to respond in gratitude and to use his many gifts to serve others. Amen.